never plays it straight. Always comes early. Always stays late. Mike Monson. Uh, he played here this past weekend, Friday night. Uh, he's done some of his training down in Mississippi with uh, Jimmy Duck Holmes and uh, there's a lineage of blues players that kind of teach the next generation and uh, he does a mix of country hill blues uh, some delta blues but he's more of a hill blues guy the rural country blues and uh, I'm gonna put some video footage at the end of this episode you should definitely check out Mike Munson if you like the blues if you like that American Ruts Mississippi I mean the mud the steamboats it's he he was really fantastic and I'm proud to say that we were fast friends he came in the cafe six weeks back maybe and we just chatted it up and it was just great I talked about blue note listened to a bunch of old blue notes together and uh, the lineage and history of black music and didn't really let on to how, many, how much of a career he had as a musician himself, which a lot of the greats do. They, they'll sit there and not really tell you that. I mean, I play guitar is was a real understatement. He's an understated fellow, I've got to say. But uh, he was just great, man. He was just fantastic and uh, knowledgeable, educated between songs about some of this history. And uh, we were proud to have him. We can't wait to have him back. Hopefully next month even. But he's got vinyl. He's got CDs. Uh, I think you can probably find them. Some of the download places. I'm not sure to be honest. But uh, like I said, I'll put a link. I'll put some videos at the end of this. And if I can get links from him to where he can buy his stuff, I'll probably do that as well. But it's rooted in that black tradition. Um, as steep an incline as it can be. It's, it's right there. And he really channeled the forefathers wonderful stuff uh, we're gonna jump right into it though a lot to cover here we've listed a lot of cool records I want to talk about in today's episode uh, some of these we're gonna just kind of skip through quickly others we're gonna dive into a little deeper I want to start with this a friend of mine came by the other day requested some Ellington and I have the original copy of the list of blues in orbit this was like an 80s uh, repackaging of it I pulled this version out just because I was looking for another record in this section, saw this one, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to play that, even though I, I usually play the original version, but I was looking to play this in the cafe, which is a Miles Ballads, and it's mostly culled from his prestige work, uh, good stuff. I mean, I, if I remember, it's... You know, it might not even be prestige, so it might all be Columbia stuff. 63. It is all Columbia stuff, I think. 63. It's weird. I thought there was some earlier stuff on here, but there's not actually. It's all ballads from his Columbia years, which makes sense being on Columbia. But uh, I could have swore there was some stuff from uh, the first quintet on prestige on here, but. Must just be uh, the Columbia stuff for that. But uh, Miles is fully voiced as a mute at this point, and a compilation of Miles ballads. That's really where you want Miles. It's you don't really want Miles doing bebop, Miles hard bop. I mean, he can do it, but it's not his strong suit. And oftentimes he would let Coltrane, Cannibal Adderley. Uh, other guys in his group kind of carry the weight on the up-tempo numbers. Uh, but when a ballad and a mute, his sour, dour, bitter nature can really shine. Obviously, emoting is what the whole point of it is. If you don't know Blues in Orbit, it's all-star Ellington, an incredible band at this point that's just on point and precise. Uh, he's at Columbia in the 50s. And he's rolling out just a stream of powerful sessions, great arrangements. He's redoing some of his older material, some of its new material. Uh, but again, it's the voicings. It's the who plays what, how they play it, and uh, his dynamics. 
I mean, he's a true orchestra leader in that sense where there's dominio and crescendo. I mean, even a song, of course, but uh, in blue. Blues in Orbit is a masterpiece session by a masterpiece composer, by masterclass musicians. It's one of the finest jazz records you'll ever let your ears enjoy. And it's out there on original formats, out there in this format, it's been repackaged in many different ways. Blues in Orbit is a must have if you think you love jazz and you think you know a lot about jazz and you don't have any Ellington, this is a great place to start with Ellington. Uh, and you should not stop there because boy, there's so much great important Ellington. But it is a hard uh, jar, jar to open up because there's a lot to unpack with Ellington's career. Again, Miles, just a collection, but it was a nice play. I think I played it three times each side. Uh, the, probably the star of this bunch of records, I think I played it, I beat 10, 12 times in the last five days. It's that good. Sometimes you just get into a, a, a mood and you're on this, this monorail and you're like, well, I don't even want to get off this rail right now. This is so perfect for my mood and my color and my tempo. And then before the Mike Munson show, I played it. People were just loving it. Uh, I played it after the Mike Munson show. I uh, ended up playing it again the next day because someone saw it on the Facebook feed and wanted to hear when they came in. And so it's really been featured heavily in the cafe this past week. And like I said, I think I probably played it 10, 12 times. One day when I first played it, I think I played each side four or five times. It's such a good listen. It's got the wonderful Hank Jones on the piano, the equally gifted Kenny Clark on the drums. So that right there tells you something about the pedigree of the session. And strangely, it's not a Savoy session. It's on the Jubilee label. And Jubilee is a little New York label uh, run by a guy by the name of Herb Abrams who actually had worked with the Erdogan brothers at Atlantic and went his own way. And there's about 112 titles in the Jubilee uh, sequence, the 1000 sequence, which runs up to about 1115. Just a few numbers omitted in that process. Uh, it's a pretty wide gamut. Early on, he's got a couple uh, college bands doing swing stuff, but he pretty quickly establishes some really great talent at Jubilee. Uh, including some Jackie McLean and Ray Draper and uh, Coltrane's with Draper. Uh, there's some uh, Donald Byrd, Gigi Grice, I believe I remember. I think there's an Art Blakey session, a Mingus session. There's some really good stuff at Jubilee. Uh, their window of ascension is like probably late 56, early 57, into 58, 59. And then they start getting into the Cheesecake album covers and those kind of coexist with some really great jazz records there for a little bit. The Herb Geller record, uh, Sound from the East or whatever that is, that's a great record. But uh, maybe it's West, I can't remember. I think it's West. But uh, so intermittently there's really great jazz records spurs in with a little bit more schlocky, but fun and really good. Uh, Latin tinged things, Cuban jazz, uh, it's just a real fun blend of stuff, but a lot of the records are getting really kind of cheesecake covers. And the really jazz titles kind of omit, didn't get that treatment. But by 18, I'm sorry, by 1070, 1080, 1090, that sequence, the covers were kind of fantastic. And the music's all good to great. And some of the best Jubilee sessions are fantastic. But this uh, Ethel Ennis record uh, from probably 55, 1021 and Jubilee does have some 10 inch material probably 15 20 10 inches tops uh, which I grab them when I see them most of it was repackaged in LP form but this has a second cover actually Lullaby for Losers uh, where she's sitting kind of in an alleyway but uh, this is the first cover uh, the pink label Jubilee label mono uh, she's a Baltimore native she sings with a black church gospel and blues that you can taste. It's just tangible and real and genuine. Lacks any form of pretense, any form of phony, any form of emulating something that came before or trying to capture what's hot or hip. It's just a genuine vernacular that she speaks and emotes in that's powerful and genuine and honest. And it's just really a powerful record. And again, when you have Hank Jones kind of directing the band, you end up with just 
precise perfection. He doesn't allow anything to get off course. He's 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 such a uh, dreamer. Lullaby for Losers. Hey Jacques, great. Bon Voyage is great. Say it ain't Sojo. Uh, Blue Prelude. Love for Sale. I mean, honestly, the entire record is a masterclass of blues gospel inflected renditions of sometimes standards and again the song isn't always what's going to dictate how a session comes out the singer doesn't always dictate how a session comes out the label and the band that backs you will greatly impact you as a singer more than the songs you select and i've talked about that before so sometimes major label stuff becomes much more commercialized because the arrangements and production becomes much bigger behind it and it kind of diminishes the role of the singer and their chance to kind of emulate it and, and fill, populate the song with themselves. The producer of the session will start putting little strings and horns and it kind of reduces what the role of the singer is in the piece. And uh, some of the more stripped down small label sessions, there's not a huge budget, there's not a big orchestra backing, you have a piano, a drum, a bass, maybe a horn. And so like that Marlene Van Plank record on last week's episode, this is just a five-star session by one of the true unheralded masters of the blues, gospel, soul, jazz, vernacular. This is, I mean, I can't really say enough about it. It's one of those records I'm not sure I even want to put away. When I pulled this out, I pulled out these together, 1023, Martha Hayes. And uh, this is also a great Jubilee cover kind of a cool uh, album cover great great singer as well a little bit more saccharine a little bit more I mean I did listen to this one quite as much as I listened to that one but by myself was great how long has this been going on it was great black coffee was great I remember a lot yeah this was good this was great stuff so again 55 maybe 56 great album cover Martha Hayes not to be confused with Martha Ray, which I showed you in last week's episode, that 10-inch with the eye. Uh, this She's a different gal. And uh, again, fairly anonymous. But these small labels sometimes withhold secrets from us that we kind of miss, that we don't know about, that didn't get the popularity and are slipped between the cracks. And a lot of times what's slipped between the cracks can be some of the best stuff. You know, it, Measure popularity is necessarily a measure of, of talent or ability or or how, how how good something is I had a friend come in the other day, and he's like I like jazz I was doing a lot going to clubs when I was younger Don't really know the artists and didn't really know where to start and he said give me give me a place to start Give me a tenor player and without much hesitation. I said Ben Webster And I played this for him and his wife and even his wife who walked in rather a jazz not so sure I'm about it. Uh, could tell she was quite enamored with Ben. Uh, ben was a vociferous drinker. I mean, the guy liked his bottle. And it became an issue for him later in his career. Uh, his size, sw he swelled up and he just, he could really put the, the booze down the throat. But you would never know by his tender tone. Just the gentle expressor of his feelings and emotions and it's always intimate and breathy and the three great tenors that shape the modern day sax player and that modern day sax player is from 1950 to the present every saxophonist especially if you're a tenor player if they're going to measure you in coleman hawkins lester young and ben webster and anybody who's measuring without those matrix doesn't know the metrics of the tenor sax and they might measure you off Rollins and Coltrane and some later guys but they're still kind of repackaging what came before uh, Dexter Gordon was a great bridge between Hawkins and and Coltrane and Rollins so Dexter Gordon's kind of that middle uh, territory there during the bebop era but every tenor player from Dexter Gordon to Coltrane to Rollins to your modern players a good jazz ear will say wow that guy's got a lot of Coleman he's got some Webster and a little bit of Lester I mean everyone's got a ratio if you play tenor you got some Lester some Coleman and some Ben 
and uh, Webster's at that because of breathy tone and that soft embouchure and just intimacy and gentle sit on my knee let me tell you a little something about how things used to be and how things should be uh, Webster's one of my favorite players and I can tell this couple was just really this was perfect for them they loved it and the Webster this record again the fantastic verb catalog this is originally a Norgran release 1001 probably from 53 54 repackaged here on the verb label 8020 probably in early 56 uh, just I can't say enough about Ben Webster tenderly uh, don't get around much anymore pennies from heaven cottontail every song on here uh, from the up tempo numbers to the mid tempo numbers but especially as a ballad player Ben Webster is just so much more what people want to hear than most people realize I trust me when I say if you buy a Ben Webster session from his verb era you will not be disappointed and your wife will thank you it's just it's so perfect again uh, probably the person I play the most in the cafe is Billie Holiday I got a lot of her stuff and I love her and she's always something I'm in the mood for plus it's something that I think most jazz beginners will either be enticed by or will, will recognize. Billy has a little bit of infamy. Uh, the name rings out. You're never quite sure. You're talking about a street gangster, a country western gangster, or a jazz singer. And Billy Holiday, boy, she just, I mean, talk about a master class and how to emote. Limited vocal range. They say it was only an octave wide, which is very narrow. But she, uh, her choice of notes, her lazy behind the beat uh, expressing, her way of impacting the music with her own experience, it's all top of the mark and it's all pained by a very difficult childhood, a difficult life, uh, from singing in brothels for nickels and pennies to the big stages in New York uh, for drug addictions and, and arrests to working for Norman Grands and the Philharmonic. Uh, she's truly an icon of this music and I play her every chance I get. And it's something often when I have live music, I'll put some Billie Holiday on after or maybe before. It's just, I mean, the term icon is overused, but she truly is an icon of this art. And I mean, it, she's so someone to emulate, but it's not about talent. In some ways, her talent is limited. It's what she does with the talent she's got. That's above and beyond almost anything you could think of. It's an athlete with very limited physical attributes that's beyond an all-star, an MVP. I mean, it's a guy or a gal that's just so overachieving, but not even based on effort, just based off sincerity and integrity just the genuine approach and the sincere sorrow that she emulates from it populates everything she sings with such a, a dignity a grace and a sorrow that if you can't feel it and hear it you're not breathing I mean you could be ignorant of what jazz is about and Billy Holiday will uh, bring you some of that light now we're talking about the torching session and again one of those convoluted verb things where this is 8026, released in 1956, with a David Stone Martin cover. However, it's a reissue of Clef 669, which might have had the same cover, actually. And I don't think this is from 10 Inches. I think this is from Clef 669. Uh, you got the great Benny Carter. You have Sweets Edison, Barney Kessel, uh, Jimmy Rawls, John Simmons, and Larry Bunker. So just, again, Norman Grant's body of musicians is such an impressive stable and uh, you really can't go wrong with anything Billy Holiday did in the 50s for Norman and she's a diminished talent at this point but uh, never to be overlooked Shirley Scott 
uh, great prestige soul jazz. It's one of those records you put it on and I mean the gospel kind of comes down. There's some potato salad and probably some beans in a pot somewhere. Uh, it's just soul food. I mean it's just, I mean it's really grit. She's not uh, going to be full of tricks and Jimmy Smith bebop. She's going to play you some soulful, hard swinging, hard grooving renditions of standards. Uh, just one of my favorite players, one of the baddest bitches in the music. She had a long career uh, it, with Stanley Turrentine at times. George Tucker and Mark, Max Simpkins ran the session out on bass and drums. But uh, she's like, she's such a skilled player. But it's always, again, from a very church-dominated, uh, bluesy sense of any of those songs. And again, I was talking with uh, Mike Munson the other day. The blues isn't about a chord progression per se, or even about uh, just playing, you know, the blues licks. Blues is as much as about feeling, and you could put the blues on top of any chord sequence. You could put the blues on a Gershwin song if you got the blues, and if you know how the blues is spoke. And she pretty much interprets everything through the lens of the blues. She has a large body of work for a woman that's kind of rare in jazz. Most of the women outside of the singers made a record or two, Mary Lou Williams, uh, Melba, Melba Liston, the short recording careers, more sidemen, very few leader records. And there's a host of female musicians that made a record or two and then uh, weren't heard from again. Clara Bryant comes to mind. But uh, Shirley really kind of broke through that gate and her string of records at uh, Prestige, it's again a master class in soul jazz and then she makes some fine records for Impulse as well, probably seven or eight titles there that are really great sessions as well. Uh, I mean, the downfall of Impulse at times is the bigger arrangements. You start getting guys that are arranging some of those sessions and they're putting a lot of packaged, produced sounds that stifle great blues players. Blues players don't need much backing and you can give them backing but the more arranged and canned and programmed that backing becomes some of the prestige sessions I mean all the prestige sessions are fantastic some of the impulse sessions can be a little bit more stifled because of the and some of the guys who were doing the arrangement were great arrangers uh, Oliver Nelson I think does a couple of her records but they're just impulse has a little too much input from the producers at times. Uh, I might have talked about her last week, Beverly Kenny has made it back in the stack. I think I did cover that one. Uh, we didn't talk about this one though. Uh, Eddie Lockjaw Davis and Johnny Griffin. I pulled a host of the prestige stuff out like a week and a half ago and went through it all. Just fantastic. Lockjaw Davis, one of my favorite players, just a blues gospel guy, full of the church. I mean, potato salad leaks out of his horn at times. Uh, very much, uh, a sensual player, very sensuous, very flirtatious, very blues, and um, that's a dang, it's a fine looking woman. Uh, Johnny Griffin out of Chicago, small little giant, gentle giant, little giant. He was just a small guy, but he could play lightning fast. And the contrast between the two of them, uh, they partnered up quite a lot, kind of like Ammons and Stitt. Davis and Griffin were on a lot of stuff together at Riverside at Prestige. It's a great body of work. It's Two of the greats with different tonalities really kind of playing off each other. They're quite playful. They're quite, doesn't feel competitive as much as it feels like a great conversation and dialogue. Battle stations. Uh, this cooks, this really does. It cooks hard. Uh, Norman Simmons on the piano, the fantastic Chicago piano player. Victor Sproul's on the bass. I believe he's also from Chicago. Then Ben Rowley on the drums. So just fantastic prestige stuff. Another Roos session, which, I mean, I love the Roos label, as I've told before. Johnny Smith, one of the most unheralded jazz forgotten players. There's a line of guitars, I guess, out there today that he invented that are uh, top of the mark jazz guitars. But Johnny Smith is one of the great vo voicers, one of the great chord uh, players. Just a wonderful, beautiful, clean tone. And with tonality with guitar is so important. And... Uh, I mean, then you have Stan Getz accompanying him here, 
which uh, I don't think this is actually from earlier attendance material, if I remember. Uh, Moonlight of Vermont. It's just, you can't go wrong with guys like Johnny Griffin, sorry, Johnny Smith, and uh, Stan Getz together. Moonlight of Vermont especially is just fantastic, and yeah, it is from several sessions. You have Paul Kinnishay on some of this, Don Lamont, Sanford Gold, Zut Sims. Just, I mean, trust me, this is a great record that if you put it on, your wife's going to be like, oh, I might actually like jazz. You can keep that Farrell Saunders stuff when you're home alone, but when I'm here and the fire's going, we got some cocoa in my cup, will you please play that record again, Johnny Smith, Moonlight in Vermont. Uh, it's, But there's so much meat on the bone here that even if you're not, per se, a uh, big guitar jazz guy or even a big jazz person, this will encompass it and really enthrall. Fantastic stuff. Another prestige session I pulled out, almost done here, Etta Jones Holler. Uh, Etta Jones is a great singer, uh, bluesy, inflected player, some great talent here. Jerome we uh, Richardson, Oliver Nelson, uh, Lem Winchester, Kenny Burrell, uh, Bucky Pizzarelli shows up on this, the great guitarist, George Vivier, Bobby Donson's on the drums, Roy Haynes shows up on the drums. So it called from several different sessions. Uh, again, Prestige 2000s, I mean, 7200 7, stuff. It's soul jazz, it's gospel, it's blues. And it's just an amazing legacy of Weinstock put together of kind of keeping the real current of jazz viable in the 7000 sequence while he puts the more kind of out stuff on the new jazz imprint. I've really come to love Prestige 71, 50, 70, 200, 70, 300. Some really good stuff there. And the last work I'm gonna show you today is by the octopus, Tal Farlow. Uh, the guy had giant, giant hands. And there's the octopus's hands right there. It allowed him to voice chords that many couldn't do. It's a trio setting with the fantastic Eddie Costa and the bass player Vinnie Burke. And Eddie Koss is one of the great piano players of that era who died young in a car accident, sadly. He made four or five records as a leader, Eddie Costa, but he does a lot as a sideman. Like, we're talking 50, 60, 70 sessions, he shows up as a sideman. So he was prolific while he was on the scene. Uh, and he's the master of the low end of the piano, the middle parts, the middle octaves, the low octaves. Most piano players will kind of accompany with their left hand, what the right hand's doing, playing, uh, you know, the roots and giving you a little low end, but it's mostly up here. And he will just go off with his left hand, giving you all kinds of low and mid parts of the piano that you don't hear very often used in quite a vociferous and expressive way. Huge fan of Eddie Costa. But Tal is one of the great players of this era. A beautiful stylist, wonderful lyricist with his, his picking and his, uh, the way he plays the notes and the chords clean uh absolutely enunciated really i love tal farlow a lot and his work again from norman grands is just top of the mark but norman didn't really hire anything less than the top of the mark at that era so that wraps up today's episode i'm gonna put a little mike month of stuff at the end of this episode here so you guys can check out what we had and if you get the chance to find his stuff you should definitely watch it. It's great. Love you all. Be safe. Be strong. If you want to support the channel, please go to Patreon or you know pledge a little money, even through uh, PayPal or through uh, YouTube itself. The YouTube money always takes me the longest to get, though. Uh, we're trying to survive here. These these events are helping, but these events cost money to put on as well. So, working 80 hours a week, tired. I'm exhausted, but. Still, I feel pretty blessed. I'm like, I'm ha living in my home, working in my home, playing music, writing music, having great talented artists here. I got a couple great artists coming this coming weekend. And so, and I also had an interesting thing this weekend where Lee Morgan's nephew called me from New Jersey and uh, Charlie Rouse's son, who's a jazz drummer, moved to Minnesota and he contacted me. And so uh, I'm hoping to have Charlie Ross and some of his guys come down here and play sometime. I'd love to have Charlie on an episode as well. Uh, I think he's kind of getting settled here up in Minnesota. But uh, it's nice that the network is uh, recognizing what this channel is about. 
and that people think that it's worthy of contacting me and reaching out to me, even people who are well established in the jazz world. So, uh, from the Jazz Shepherd, thanks all very much. I'll be safe. Uh, love your jazz. Play it. Dig it. It's, it's such an important part of American history. We'll talk to you all soon. Have a great day. Peace. Get to ride, hide town. Face right in somewhere I've never been.